follows an extract from my book Fet Fatale, available from Amazon. Chapter 1, Part 1 Beth Williams sat at the dining room table looking out onto the garden, idly stirring her porridge and sipping her tea. This process could take quite some time as she always ate her breakfast oats, lukewarm and stodgy. Andrew, her husband, was carrying a bag of Blair's pellets down to the hen enclosure and she gave him a little wave. She smiled to herself as she laughed at her long-standing joke. When they first met in the art department refectory, she had nicknamed him Drew in reference to his field of study and now his occupation. She thought the nickname hilarious then and still laughed at it now 30 years later even though nobody else did, and usually responded with an obligatory rolling of the eyes. They both worked from home, Beth as a piano teacher and Drew as a freelance architectural illustrator, combining his flair for artistic expression with his skill in technical drawing. On occasion, he also worked at the Whitworth Art Gallery Manchester in the conservation and restoration of art there. They had laid the foundation of their relationship well in those early years by the refractory coffee machine and these days shared tea breaks were still plentiful. Looking up she saw Drew blow her a kiss across the lawn and returning the gesture she roused herself and thought of the day ahead. She'd arranged to spend the morning with Phoebe, destoning a cartload of damsons and acting as General Dog's Body in a marathon jam-making session for the forthcoming Women's Institute Summer Fete. It wasn't her ideal way to spend a morning and she was reluctant to make a move. Through the window she wiggled her cup at Drew to ask if he wanted to join her and a thumbs up spurred her to go and put the kettle on. Surely the world wouldn't end if they didn't churn out 40 jars of damson jam that morning. However, checking that thought, Beth considered that it just might. Phoebe's jam was earth-shatteringly delicious and Beth had been trying to get a recipe out of her for years. Phoebe's culinary skills were more art than science. She didn't own a set of measuring scales and cooked by intuition and rack of the eye. The only way to try and pin it down was to see her in action. That in itself was worth pitting hundreds of damsons. This morning even more was at stake than just discovering confectionery secrets as the jam was to be judged for the annual Women's Institute Award and this was a serious matter. Although the damson jam was bound to be a podium winner, the coveted first prize was by no means secure as Jean's rhubarb and rose petal jam was also a hot favourite. It was a close contest and things could get sticky. Drew came in from the garden and planted a kiss on Beth's lips. What are your plans for today? I'm at Phoebe Simmons, remember? We're filling the world with damson jam today. We need to get it done before that load of fruit gets past it, unlike you or me. Speak for yourself. It sounds like you need some added sugar or you'll stop the jam from setting with that attitude. I'll get my own lunch then and I'll see you for a quick brew before your pupils start to arrive. He looked over to the sofa and spoke to the dog. It's just you and me today, Noodle. Some guy time at last, buddy. The aged Bichon Poodle Cross exposed a fluffy tummy to express his appreciation at the prospect. Phoebe was already elbow deep in purple goo and a deep fruity smell enveloped Beth as she stepped inside. Carefully controlled chaos was evidently in progress. The kitchen was a small square of ancient pine. Honeyed pine cupboards, gone orange with age, lined the walls and a small pine table with three chairs sat tucked away in the corner next to a pantry recessed into the wall. The table was covered with jam jars, each with a dose of water inside, waiting to go into the hot oven to sterilise. Bags and bags of sugar waited ad hoc on the work surface and the jam kettle sat waiting on the hob. Beth wondered at the title, Jam Kettle. It was a wholly inappropriate name for what amounted to nothing more than a huge boiling pan. For years she had imagined a gigantic copper-coloured kettle with a vast, curvaceous spout and a tin lid which rattled ominously as the jam simmered beneath. 
She still hadn't outlived her disappointment at such a misconception and she looked at the slightly battered mini cauldron with regret. This was going to be jam making via the old school. No need for measuring scales, specially jam sugar or sachets of pectin. All that would be required would be the basic ingredients and a certain amount of sweat and tears if Beth was left unsupervised for too long. The morning passed pleasantly and there was plenty to chat about over the thankfully regular tea breaks. Phoebe asked about Beth's family. Emma Graham, Beth's daughter, was married to Nathaniel and lived at the edge of the village in Lilac Cottage with their four-year-old daughter Primrose and Walter the Labradoodle who caused more fuss and mayhem than Primrose ever could. John T, Emma's elder brother, lived in Manchester and was a trombonist with the BBC Philharmonic Orchestra. Matt, the youngest, had not long since left home and now lived in a small apartment in the nearby market town Aldersfield. As Beth was stirring the bubbling mass, she asked, How is Mike getting on with the hens? Will he be ready for the poultry competition at the FET? He's out there all the time, Phoebe complained about her husband. The hen house is cleaner than this kitchen. He doesn't like them getting their feet dirty and if they get a bit of mud on them, he's created a special foot spa so that he can soak their claws. I wouldn't be surprised if he gave them a manicure next. It sounds quite luxurious. Do you think he'd let me have a go? I don't mind sitting next to some hens so that I can have a foot massage. He's taking the poultry competition very seriously. Do you know who's judging it this year? It's John Barlow and Mike's not happy at all. I'd heard that old Davidson was passing on the baton. Nobody's going to be able to follow in his footsteps very easily. I'm sure that John will be as fair as he knows how. I do know that he's taking the responsibility very seriously and he's doing a lot of reading up. I suppose that's all he can do. Nobody else seems very keen to take on the job. There will be quite a few contestants and they won't want to miss out on competing by acting as judge instead. I'm sure that Mike wouldn't want to give up the chance to take part. He's pretty keen on the subject, but he'd rather compete, wouldn't he? He'd be just the man for the job. Every time somebody shows just a polite interest, I can guarantee what he'll say next. He'll launch into his favourite speech and say, You know, hens and racehorses are very similar. He thinks this is funny. It's not. It's sad. I can't wait to hear how, said Beth. His punchline is that if a racehorse breaks its leg, it has to be killed. And so does a hen. He doesn't quite see that a prize racehorse is almost priceless, whereas a hen can be replaced for a few quid. Did you know that he uses a soft baby brush to smooth down their feathers? It's worrying, I tell you. He probably brushes their feathers more than I brush my hair. Ouch! The spluttering lava of sugary liquid spattered over at Beth's arms, putting a stop to any further conversation and gave Phoebe the signal to take over. She openly scorned the mention of a jam thermometer. All she needed was a saucer in the fridge and an expert digit on her right hand. As they were pouring the molten liquid through the funnel into the warm dry jars, Beth said, You know, I think Emma's microwave method might have some distinct advantages. At least she doesn't get blisters on her arms. You've got something there. And her lemon curd is really tasty, but if you make it her way, you can only get two or three jars at a time. It's not normal to want about 40 jars at once though, is it? We don't need to preserve our summer produce these days. And no matter how tasty your jam is, if you had to eat all of this yourself, you'd rather starve than see another damson by the end of the year, said Beth. I hope you've made the winning brand. I'll kill Jean Barlow if she wins again this year. We could try bribing the judge, if we knew who it was. Perhaps it's as well we don't. We'll trust to luck instead. On that same morning, the rival preserve was in preparation. Jean Barlow took lone command in her kitchen. It was a large modern room of light beech wood and black marble. Every surface glistened. 
a large pan stood on the hob of the stainless steel double oven which housed racks of warming jam jars. Alongside the precise rows of rhubarb cubes lay heaps of pink and yellow rose petals. Unlike Phoebe, Jean adopted the scientific approach and a jam thermometer, sachets of pectin and specific jam sugar stood at the ready. She'd explained to Beth once that specialist preserving sugar is made up of larger crystals, which allows the sugar to dissolve more slowly and reduces the risk of burning. At that moment, Jean was carefully weighing piles of rose petals on a set of sensitive digital scales. First prize was at stake and she was leaving nothing to chance. Her husband, John, had gone out for the morning. Since the onset of diabetes, jam was considered off the menu for him and it was all a bit too unfair to have to smell it all morning and not get a taste. Secretly, Jean had laid aside a small jar as a special treat. Surely one little jar of jam eaten in small rations over a few days couldn't do any harm. For the full book of Fête Fatale, available in paperback or as an e-book, follow the link in the cards in the description box or find details on my website at SharonBill.com. Thanks for listening.